Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Alicia. Good evening, Beverly. I see we, we have uh, Josh Vogel here with us from DCP. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming. And uh, Mr. Henry Hoffman. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Are you a representative of um, someone or? No, I'm actually, I'm an NYU urban planning student um, and we have to attend a land use meeting from a community board meeting. So I'm here to observe. Oh, great. Well, thank you yeah. for choosing us. We're always, we're always happy to be entertaining. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. Sure, and uh, Emily Humes, good evening. Are you one of our residents? Or, uh... um, Emily's Parks Department says so she'll just be listening in. Um, oh, hi, great, okay. Planning. Hi, sorry, I just added my computer audio. Yes, I'm from the Parks Department. So is this just like a preview and then the, the committee will be holding another hearing, official hearing once the- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, so actually I just, let me just confirm with you. My understanding from your email was that you expect the 962-972 Franklin project to be certified in about 60 days, maybe a little bit less since you emailed us last week. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it'll be May at the earliest. Okay. And um, prior to that, would there be uh, like a public hearing on the EIS or just, it will just be released? There should, there uh, yeah, should it'll be, be hearing, right? it'll be part of the certification hearing at, at review session. Okay. Okay. So it will be a public hearing that we get notice of at the board, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. We'll make sure well in advance the second that we Okay. Uh, schedule it that we send it over to you guys so you can have okay. plenty of so, notice yeah. to, to attend. Um, we had uh, invited Mr. Wallace, who's a representative of the developer, to attend to present the project, but uh, it sounds like he wanted to wait until April. So I, I guess we'll we'll discuss it some tonight and then we'll discuss it again when he comes and then uh, we'll discuss it again when it's certified. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so there's gonna be no applicant presentation tonight, then. I it does Mia. I don't. We didn't hear from him, right? Um, we reached out, and no. Okay. I believe that he is going to uh, defer off until April. Okay. Andrew, good evening. Nice to have you with us again. Hi, good evening. Happy daylight savings time. Oh, right. Rod, good evening. Oh, and um, Josh, so we have another project that was recently filed, 7399 Empire Boulevard, and it looks to me like they only filed their initial EAS. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you have, uh, if you're able to give us a heads up at this point, um, what the schedule looks like on that one. 
Yeah, thanks. So we, they did um, schedule the, um, oh, sorry, they did file their land use application. Okay. So um, that's the first filed. Uh, we haven't even reviewed it yet, so it'll take some time. It'll be at, at least a couple months. Um, but uh, Jordan, who's the lead planner for it and the CB9 liaison, um, can definitely keep you guys in the loop once we get a little closer to uh, certification. But I would, this spring is maybe aggressive. It's possible, but um, okay. Yeah, I mean, we're, just we're really in general, not sure you know, for, until we review for the it and community. see the quality of it. Multiple. Okay, for the community boards, you know, we don't meet over the summer. June is our last meeting, so um, you know, I just like to work with you guys to make sure that the certification doesn't happen over the summer so that we don't really have a chance to meet, you know, to, to discuss it. Totally. And noted. Um, I'll, I'll relay that to Jordan and um, make sure he communicates with you, but uh, on that. So the board has plenty of time to, when you're not, um, not during the summer, when you're back um, or before to okay. have the hearing. All right. Thanks so much. Um, we're just about to start, but Alicia, is there anything urgent? I'm, I'm just a little, I just will have a question for Josh. It appears that, um, the Empire application is actually to uh, change the C8 designation. And I know that is normally the policy of the city, uh, not to allow a private developer to break such designations especially because the C8 designation does not allow any kind of commercial, I mean, residential. And so I just wanted to know why was the uh, Department of City Planning not entertaining this application when clearly it's more like a spot rezoning where you're just kind of asking to break uh, the longstanding uh, commercial corridor, especially in the time in which the city of Yes is making the claim that it needs more commercial enterprises and you know, as you know C8s have every type of um, commercial enterprise that's allowed on its corridors. So why are you entertaining this? Because I've never seen an application where they entertain a private developer to break a C8 designation. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, it is a private application so really we're just reviewing the application and then if the application is complete and they submitted all the materials uh, you know, it's, it's we're city charter mandated to to certify it and, and bring it into public review. Um, ap apologies, I'm not the lead planner for this application, um, so I, I really don't have much information on the content of it. Um, but we can definitely, you know, have that discussion um, during public review. But it is my understanding that you don't accept all the applications that get submitted, that you only actually accept 60% of them. If I'm if another, uh, you know, from what I've been told by uh, the Department of City Planning. No, so. Any any land use application that's fi filed with the department, uh, if it, it's a complete application, um, we, it goes through, it goes into ULERP. We, we don't choose what we accept and what we don't. You know, the department will make recommendations to the planning commission on, you know, if we support the application or not. Um, but in terms of accepting it and allowing it to start public review, that that's not our decision. You know, we're mandated by the charter to to accept these applications, private applications, uh, certify them, and bring them into ULERP so the community can opine on them. Okay. So okay. is there um, a way we're gonna, we need to get started? Um, so uh, you know, just just a reminder um, of the rules of conduct. Uh, raise your hand if, if you want to speak and, um, you know, respect others, no personal attacks, no, uh, uh, you know, no, no comments of a, of a racially or religious derogatory nature. Um, and, and that's really it, you know, try to limit your comments and questions to two minutes. Um, Okay, uh, so let's start with some um, updates from the committee members. Um, before I start, does anybody have anything that they want to share? What do you mean share, Suki? 
Um, usually we do committee member updates. So if somebody wants to um, update us about something that they've heard or um, you know, some something in the news, something important that's relevant to our committee. Um, yeah, things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give a quick update then on some old business. Um, we had discussed and voted on City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. I know that many of us had a lot of concerns about that, about the approach that was taken, the, you know, sort of citywide approach um, to changing a lot of the longstanding regulations. The City Planning Commission voted on it last week. They did vote to approve it um, almost unanimously with one no vote. I think there were some commissioners who continued to express some concerns, um, particularly about the um, expansion of uh, in-home um, occupations, um, but they, they voted for the package. Um, so it goes to the city council now. Um, I do not know, Mia, do we know when there's a hearing date? Can, can you find out and send it out to us when there's a city council hearing? Definitely. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, green fast track was laid over at the commission's last meeting. I don't know when they'll be voting on it. Uh, Josh, since you're here with us, do you have any idea? Josh? Oh, yeah, sorry. It wasn't allowing me to unmute for a second. Um, I don't have the answer right now apologies i was just uh, originally coming to listen in for the 962 application oh, but okay. i again will uh talk to jordan and I'll make sure he uh, sends that to you guys tomorrow All right, no worries um so uh that's about it our city of yes um commit subcommittee met to discuss housing opportunity um there was a lot of discussion around the ami levels that are being proposed. Initially, they'd thrown out something around the 80% of AMI level, which is now around $100,000 for a family of three. Um, I think everybody felt that that's on the high side for our district. The AMI levels have really gone up a lot in recent years. Um, and uh, so our district's median income, I think the latest figures are showing it around $77,000. And so that's really around the 60% of AMI level. And, um, you know, a below median income for our district is really more at the 40 or 50% of, of AMI level. Um, what else? So we talked about some of the low density um, housing options. Um, you know, the ADUs, the um, basement unit, um, basement units, um, the backyard units, um, that sort of thing. Um, I think people are understanding that uh, the basement units are something that already happens in, in Brooklyn. Um, you know, there are some concerns and questions about what modifications might have to be made to make that safe, you know, to make sure that tenants are safe. Um, you know, questions about whether some of this might be substandard housing, uh, you know, why, why would we be allowing this now versus not before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we'll continue with that discussion. And I think the next City of Yes meeting um, will probably be moving on to the missing middle proposals um, and, you know, starting starting to um, put together our responses on the whole thing. Hopefully by then the actual text amendment will have been released. Um, what else do I have for you? Okay, so uh, I invited Council Member Hudson's office to attend this meeting and they did say they would try to send a representative. Um, they also said that the council member has expressed that uh, she is opposed to any development at 962 Franklin that would harm the Botanic Gardens. Um, and she has urged the Department of City Planning to reject any um, certification if that's the case. So I'll, uh, you know, Josh, I don't I don't know if it's, it's appropriate for us to, 
you know, let forward you that communication, but that's um that's what I heard from her her staff. Um uh and then, of course, you know, we have some new, a new application. We have the 7399 Empire Boulevard. Um, uh, what else? That's kind of all I have for updates. Um, I had also sent out to the committee um, some news about new housing programs that have been announced, like all literally in the last week that I think are important for us to be aware of. Um, the Faith-Based Affordable Housing Act, which is at the state Senate level, state Senate and Assembly level, um, and the mayor and the city council have both announced programs to raise capital um, to fund affordable housing. Um, uh, the city council um, uh, push is for two HPD programs, one that's for affordable co-ops, the other one that is for um, restoration of rent stabilized housing. And the mayor's fund is with the Building Trades Congress, um, the, un the building unions um, for workforce multifamily housing. It's not clear whether that's rental or, but I, I would assume so. Um, so those are important things to keep in mind, um, you know, as we think about what kind of housing is is possible, um, you know, because now we don't have 421A and that that's actually not just the tax credit, but a lot of developers I think relied on that uh, to put together financing. Um, what else? D does anyone else have anything they want to update us on at this point? Um, You know, if anybody's hearing anything from their elected officials, if there's anything going on with Vital Brooklyn that we should know about. Alicia? Just for, for clarity's sake, that the, the part, City Planning Commission did make some minor changes to the, the economic tax amendments they have removed, they have increased, they have reinstated the thousand square foot and they have also prevented um, the conversion of residential to commercial in existing buildings. So that means it's not going to happen in the existing buildings. That way it doesn't affect. Well, um, that, as, right, that's for the upper floors. Um, right, the upper floors conversion. However, the, the, when you, the speaking about, um, the proposal that has now, you know, some memorandum that has been signed between, you know, the union and the mayor to create workforce option housing for, you know, uh, workers. I just want people to be aware that that starts at $130,000 and moves up. The workforce option is one of the most expensive, highest AMIs in the mandatory inclusionary housing program. So it's going to, you have to be, let's say um, it is comparable to the residents who live in Park Slopes, for example, it's a little bit above their average medium income. So the fact that they're claiming it's for the workforce, quote unquote, is really not for the workforce. It's going to be for high end market rate housing, if it, especially if it comes into communities like ours. And that's yeah, really well, we can um, definitely, I, I um, would like to talk about that a little bit more later, um, but I just, um, I kind of want to get to the rezoning applications first. Um, Nicola? Hi, one, one note based on our meeting, our city of yes meeting last week, uh, that I think it's key for this group to think about. Um, was that map that you created, Suki? And I, I believe I saw it in Gothamist, or there's another article um, that was basically saying the same thing, that truly affordable housing that is going to address some of our, um, the housing crisis, um, the high density, medium to high density communities will bear the brunt of creating that housing. The low density options, when you look at it, it they'll create housing, 
but they're not going to be based on the nature of the units. They're not going to be truly affordable. They're not going to address the deep um, affordable units that need to be created. So we need to bear in mind that although we've been told that um, City of Yes really isn't for, we know CB9, you've done your fair share. This is to create uh, a little bit of housing all over the city. When it comes to really creating affordable housing, a backyard unit is not going to do the job. A basement apartment is not going to do the job. Um, probably commercial conversions won't do the job because it's going to cost too much and they're not going to have the ability to provide the deep discounts. So once again, uh, our community, Williamsburg, Bushwick, all of the typical players that are currently bearing the brunt, from my opinion, will continue. And so we need to keep that in mind and make sure that we address some of these concerns when we um, when we talk about housing and the economic opportunity. Yeah, I, I think Nicola is completely right. I, I think that the UAP program is, is going to lead to an enormous surge in development in our neighborhood because we have so much unrestricted R6, which is the category that's earmarked for the highest amount of increase in development. And and that R6 is, is already an overzoning um, on all of these blocks that have small houses. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I definitely share that share that concern. And the low density proposals do not require affordable housing. Um, it was somewhat shocking to me that even the proposals for shared dwelling units, which are essentially SROs, which you know SROs traditionally are like rent controlled apartments, but there would be no no income requirements or rent caps for those. Um, so essentially we're getting back SROs, but at any price, which is a little, you know, that's very surprising to me. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So I guess um, we should move on to new business now. Oh, and so Franklin Avenue, um, we had originally invited him for March, but it sounds like he wants to come in April. And um, before some people got here, uh, I was just saying to jo uh, jo Josh Vogel from DCP is here with us. So thank you for coming, Josh. Um, he was saying that it's not likely to be certified before May. So the certification at that point, um, that's when the ULER process could begin. Um, so, I mean, I'm just thinking like, Josh, you learned normally we have 60 days to review at the community board, right? But then if it certifies in May, we're running into this summer. Is that what is is that your understanding of Yes, that's so yeah. Once it certifies, it'll be referred to uh the board and uh the review period is 60 days. Um I would need to check with our land use review division on how we make exceptions if we do, uh, because of course you're not the only board that takes a summer recess. Um, so yeah, I can I can follow up on how we handle that if okay. it does run into uh, the months that the board is off. Okay, yeah, I would really appreciate that. Thank you, Beverly. Can we um? Can we talk about? or is there a way I can ask DP is there a way because all of these major constructions are coming up in a three block radius the dust the interference with quality of life there has to be a way that they can plan better right now we have three four going on when those two get near completion then the spice factory and the one on empire be starting there has to be some consideration for the people who live in those communities. That's my question. Anybody answer? Josh, you want to take that one? <laughs> I, I, I know you're... Uh... Uh, I'll just say for 962 Franklin, it's, it's just a land use application for rezoning at the moment. Nothing's been approved. Um, so I think it's, uh, 
yeah, I, I definitely, you know, can't speak to construction because we're just so far away from that. Uh, but there is this rezoning has not been approved at the moment. It's not even in ULERP, so I, I can't speak to, you know, a hypothetical okay. approval. I, I realize you I, I realize you're pushing this back. But the fact of the matter is this. It's just a matter of time. And all those projects right now, we have two on three on Franklin, one on Empire. And that's not even counting the one that's getting ready to start that they just filed the paperwork for. So, and for the last couple months, everybody's sneezing and the dust and the and the, there has to be and and when and when the buildings are built and this is the sad part about all of it, Nicola, Suki, all of you guys were already talking about it. It's not going to be for people who live here in desperate need of families who who are growing and they want their grandkids to live not far from them or they want their daughter to live not far. Those apartments are not going to be for them. And that's what's sad about all of this. And, but there is no consideration for staggering these developments so that the people who already live here can at least survive the development. And there has to be something that DEP can do. Well, that Beverly, do you mean DEP as in addressing, you know, the environmental concerns like like the dust or or are you asking DCP? That's two, three months. Beverly, between, are you... between blocking up all of the sidewalks for I mean, and they block them up with these gate kind of things or the pylons so that they'll have parking when they come in in the morning between blocking it up when they come for construction with the construction trucks and then the dust everywhere. There has to, there is a quality of life issue. There is an environmental issue, regardless of what the paperwork says. There is a noise issue, regardless of what the paperwork says. So we're talking about zoning and, 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 and development and affordable housing, none of this is the affordable housing. Let's start with that. But they're doing all of this at the expense of people who already live here. So, so Josh, is the, this, is, this is something that has been raised um, numerous times about the cumulative impacts of construction. Is there any requirement? that a cumulative impact study be done for rezonings that are, let's say within a half mile radius, because she's right that there's a lot in this area. Yeah, no, thank you for the, the question. And I, I totally hear uh, your concern and, you know, the issues with noise and, uh, you know, additional traffic from construction, dust, et cetera, is, is, um, a real issue that, you know, we all see in as New Yorkers and, you know, impacts all of us. Um, you know, we at city planning, we control land use and zoning. So as of right developments, we really don't have any control over that's more of a department of buildings issue. Uh, but, you know, for larger rezonings, we do do an environmental review, which looks at things like noise and construction. And if they do, um, see that there will be impacts, the environmental review will look to mitigate uh, those impacts. Um, but it sounds like a lot of what you're speaking to are, are as of right developments. Um, so again, that that would be more, you know, Department of Buildings or, you know, enforcement from the police department if it's double park trucks or, or vehicles. Um, again, it's, we, we really just control the, the zoning. Okay, um, Felice? Felice? Uh, I had to unmute. Yes, yes, um, everybody has to unmute. And so Beverly is factual in what she's saying. I live on Washington, so I am on the block, but on the, the other end of it. And I saw first pictures of the asbestos that was taken out, okay? The men not even properly geared. They didn't have gloves, masks, eye goggles, um, not the proper uh, gear to remove this. And so for the building department or DEP 
to allow this to go on or put to happen you know, is extremely dangerous. Asbestos, once airborne, it affects everyone. I know this for, I used to work for DEP, okay? So something has to, someone, something has to be accountable of what's happening around us. We should not, the consequence of the greed of people and what they want to do, okay? And what they have done. So something has to give, and I we have to collectively together make a demand now because um, these buildings are not affordable. Okay, what do you mean affordable? They are not affordable. Okay, they are not. I mean, I'm living in a building right now, a pre-war building, that an apartment is six thousand dollars. How insane is that? Along with nine forty-one Washington Avenue. And then they break it down. Yes, they put it down. Yes, they did construction work and got the apartment while we were living here. I had to call on Tish James to do some enforcement that the building apartment should have done. I'm angry about this. Yes, I am. Okay. And people did get sick. And yes, people are feeling what's going on presently with these buildings that's being built, it's not even one at a time. It's like everyone together. So it's hitting us hard. It's hitting us hard. So what are we gonna do about it? That is the question. Thank you, Beverly, for bringing that up. Thank you, Felice. Teresa? Yeah, I, I wanna tag along with what's being discussed with the um, air quality environmental impact issues that are happening in our neighborhood now. I too live in a neighborhood where we have this massive amount of development happening all around us. And there are constant, continuous environmental, I don't, I'm sorry. Um, they are not, uh, following the law, none of these developers, none of the construction people are, and it's it's they're they're doing things like pouring concrete. The 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 gray on um, Bedford water doesn't even go down. It there's so much there's so much concrete in there. This is happening all over the sidewalk, the air. It's really it's really bad to walk around every single day. And what we're being exposed to and the effects that will happen with people in this neighborhood are, I'm sure, a lot of cases of, of cancer and other diseases, um, long-term issues. And um, DCP is like, oh, whatever, it's not, it's not us, you know? And we know how they beha have behaved with all these developments. They have not been um, supportive of us and our community. So I, I, I'm disappointed and I, I don't know what to do about it. I mean, the number of complaints and the, the DOB kind of brushes it aside, the in, environmental groups sometimes, you know, there, there's a lot of, you can see, for example, the, um, the Firestone, uh, Empire, Bedford, Sullivan Place, how many fines they've been given, how many times they've been visited and those are due to people in the neighborhood complaining. Not the DOB doesn't go there on their own. The, nobody goes there on their own. You have to complain. People in the neighborhood have to complain. There is zero oversight for any of these without neighborhood complaints. And I find that atrocious. And we often don't know, like I've learned quite a lot, thanks to like Mr. Herbert has helped me and my neighbors with, um, how to file complaints and get some follow-up and get things done when they're dumping concrete in the middle of the street down the sewers it happens every day like this is it's really bad here you know and then our elected aren't aren't helping us i don't really have any faith in any of these city organizations i think the feds are about the only ones that are going to help us so um thanks for listening to me complain. Uh, 
Alicia? She's muted. Yeah, I'm muted. So just for clarity's sake, Ed, Josh, so that you are familiar with this community, um, all of these applications, all of these um, developments are happening as a result of rezonings. So let's just be clear about that. The current ones that are now in the construction phase was done by DCP. And the proposed ones are, again, going in front of DCP. But I'm not exactly complaining about DCP at this point in time, because the two applications that are in front of the community actually have uh, the, our city council person is responsible for that. So if you need to focus your energy on anybody, it's not DCP, which is a government entity that's controlled by the mayor anyway. And so whatever they do, they do because the mayor tells them to do it. Well, we have Andre Robinson in, in this uh, meeting. I think your comments and concerns should be addressed to him because it is city councilwoman Hudson who behind closed doors is approving these projects. I know Hudson has told us that she's not approving, you know, the the uh, the, Empire, the the Franklin Avenue rezoning project, but it's moving forward. So when a council person says no, it stops a project because of deference. So when it moves forward, it's because she, somebody saying yes behind closed doors. And the same thing with the Franklin Avenue rezoning proposal that just hit. Um, it was noted in the paper that people had been lobbying city uh, Hudson, clearly going to her and speaking to her about it. When we met with her, she did not disclose this, even though we talked about Empire. She did not disclose the fact that she was approving this project. And so if you're going to fight these two existing projects that are currently in our neighborhood, it is not DCP that you need to be complaining to. It is your local council person because it's only them that can stop it. So only city, only Hudson can stop these two proposals. And so let's try to focus that. So I have a question for Andrew Robinson and because he's here representing um, Ms. Hudson. What, why did, um, what has been the city council's position on the Empire Boulevard rezoning application, since she has been lobbied for that, it was noted inside of the newspaper, and what position is she taking with that to justify more development in this community when we clearly have a lot of a lot of development within a very short square radius? That's a question for you, Andrew. Andre. Andre, sorry, Andre. Um, I'm not sure. I I did see him very briefly. I'm oh, he not just sure. he just I just he's saw there. Yes. He's, yeah, I just saw the video turn on, so he's here. He's present. He might be I trying agree. to figure out to right. how to unmute. Yes, I was um I was trying to unmute um, but it wasn't allowing me to unmute. So um once again, I'm Andre Robinson. I am one of the newer staffers in Council Member Hudson's office. Um, and I am going to be the staffer that's going to be assigned to CB9. Um, I'm not sure what her position is on Empire. Uh, we, I just learned about this meeting literally like maybe a half hour ago. I'm actually at Andrew, another you meeting. I told you about this a long time ago. No, you did not tell me about this particular meeting a long time ago. I got the email for this meeting literally a, a, probably like closer to five. Um, and Andrew responded back that, you know, we were all out to different things. Again, I did give you guys my email on the last call that we did have with the councilwoman. And I said to just please let me know directly like what particular meetings that you guys are having. And I will try to tap into those meetings um, as much as I possibly could, that's one. And then two, if you let me know what the topics of discussion are, I could have a debrief with the council member. So that, that way I could be prepared to kind of give, you know, whatever her thoughts or whatever her her points are in regards to the things that you guys are addressing. Um, but again, so like in terms of your question, Ms. Boyd, I'm not too sure what they are, but if you can give me your concerns, I can definitely have a conversation with the councilwoman and then I can, you know, relay those those pieces of information. I mean, I know well, on the call we did talk about, um, there were a couple of developments that you guys did bring up, um, one of which she said that she wasn't in support of, um, and she's not going to approve that. Um, and I know um, 
I'm not sure who Suki is, um, but I know I, I'm, Andrew. I'm the is. chair of Land Use. Oh. oh, hey, how are you? I'm sorry. Hey. Um, nice to meet you. I know Andrew nice did. Um, like they were like maybe. So Andrew is my coworker. So there's an Andrew and there's an Andre. Um, I know he did like answer like maybe two things that were on the agenda, which I'm not sure if it was in regards to the Empire one um, that we did see, um, you know, just briefly, like we gave like a point or two. Um, but again, you you know, um, Alicia, as she said, if you guys do have any concerns or anything specific, um, you can definitely send those to me. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, if you want to talk to me about anything specifically offline, just to kind of get um, the council members uh, uh, stance or whatever on it, I am definitely here to be that individual. And, you know, hopefully, like, you know, next time if I have a little bit more um, preparation and I know exactly what you guys are talking about, I can get that information and be able to discuss it with the council member. But, you know, again, I got this this email in regards to this meeting literally today, probably like an hour or two before I was leaving the office, again, going to other meetings. So just as long as if you give me what you guys are actually going to talk about, I can have the discussion with her and get back. Um, so I, I, I don't like to come on a meeting and say or you know, give the wrong information um, for the member. So I don't want to say what she is for and what she isn't for without having a conversation with her to know exactly what that is. Oh, yeah. Well, we appreciate well, you okay. being here to listen. Yeah, so I, I definitely, yeah, I definitely will listen. Um, that's always 100% as I did during the other meeting. You know, I will take my notes so that that way I know exactly, you know, what you guys are asking for so that that way I can, you know, bring that information back to the council. Well, uh, one thing also, Andre, am I saying it right? Yes, Andre, yes, that's correct. Okay, okay, I do apologize if I mispronounced it. You're hearing yeah, voices of the community right now concerning these two applications that are going forward. So hopefully, without a formal, um, you know, communication that you're listening to the, the community residents and seeing that we're not happy with these two potential development projects and that we will, you know, be looking towards City Council uh, Hudson to to um, defend our community and protect it. Thank you. Esteban? Got it. No, no problem. Yeah, I just want to um, I just want to stress the fact that this is not I mean, most of us are volunteers here. It's not our responsibility to keep the council member apprised of what's going on as a community board. Um, it is a government agency. The uh, the agenda is printed. It's sent out. And I realize that you didn't have this information, so I'm not calling you out or anything like that. But um, but I think you might be the first person to come to a, a community. I mean, to a to a Euler meeting in the entire time that the council member has been in office. So. That's a problem, and it should not be on us as community members and volunteers and residents to uh, to give this information to somebody who has access to the community board as a as a community as a government agency. So, um, yeah. That's... So okay. thank you, thank you for that comment, um, Esteban. I just want to respond to it. Thank you for that comment. Um, like I said, I'm a new staffer here. It's community board nine is going to be my community board. Um, so I, like I said, I definitely will be tapping in more to um, your meetings. Again, I can't commit to every single um, committee meeting that's going to be happening in CB9, but I'm, you know, that's why I came on this one because it is my community board, regardless of whether or not I'm physically at a, a whole nother event and had to come outside from that event. Um, but I just wanted to be on just to be able to, you know, hear what you guys are talking about. And, you know, I'll just be, I'll be doing that more moving forward in the future so that that way I, you know, I can inform the councilwoman of what's actually happening what's going on so Thank you know you. i don't know what what happened in the past but you know we, we're moving forward and you know just trying to be more proactive in in this particular community board okay thank you uh tom were you raising your hand mr herbert has up his hand oh okay um rod all right can you hear me yes Okay, so I just wanted to go back on the other items that were discussed with regards to the uh, dust uh, due to the construction. Right? So every construction project that's on file with the city, right, the builders have to file what's known as a dust mitigation plan, and they have to make that plan available to the DOB all right, upon request. All right, so if there's any concern with dust, the concern would go to the DOB. 
All right. And in some cases, the DEP, if there's an aggregate amount of dust, that's just all over the place. All right. Now, as far as asbestos, if anybody feels that there's asbestos that has been released into the atmosphere, they should contact the DEP right away and they should request that air sampling and wipe samples be taken in the area. All right. So there's no reason to uh, think that there's nothing that can be done, especially with asbestos. But the DEP will definitely come out if there's a release of asbestos into the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. That's very helpful. Um, it sounds to me like we should request that the district office put together a list of all of these complaints and concerns and you know, you should write down if you already have filed a complaint with a city agency yet and forward it, um, you know, have it be something that Dante can bring up at, at the monthly district service cabinet meetings, as well as forwarding it to the council members. Um, can, can I get like a quick show of hands from the committee members? If we think that, um, you know, our, our committee should should be asking for that. Um, well, okay, let me take attendance. Uh, Beverly is here. Uh, Suki, I'm, I'm here. Esteban is here. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Um, uh, Nicola is here. Uh, John Wolfling is here. Tom Thomas. Tom, are you still here? Yeah, Tom's here. Um, uh, John Craver is absent. Um, and uh, Pat Moses is absent. So um, is anyone on the committee opposed? Suki, I'm here as well. Yaakov. Sorry, who's that? Yaakov is here as well. Oh, Yaakov. Hi, iPhone. Okay. <laughs> I thought that might be you. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, is there anyone from the committee who would be opposed to having the office put together a list of some of these concerns that you all have mentioned? And, um, you know, I rely on you guys to actually email the office, uh, CC me, um, you know, and and have Mia send out something, and and Dante take this up. And anybody opposed? Just raise your hand or think that something should be added or or changed. You want to read the concerns, and we could uh, or, 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 or articulate the concerns. I mean, I think what Beverly was saying before about noise and dust from multiple construction projects. Um, traffic uh you know they're they're kind of like placing cones on this blocking off the sidewalk sometimes they're taking up parking spaces um uh teresa was complaining about asbestos i think Luis mentioned the asbestos as well um you know i i, I think for the office to address these with the city agencies they have to be specific right that there has to be an address it has to be like this was observed at this time at the, you know, and, and this place, um, you know, pictures help obviously, but just a list of all of them, you know, particularly if they're all happening within a small area, I think um, this is something that they should be raised together. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I may have misunderstood, but I think Beverly was addressing the potential for future issues if there's a bunch of construction projects happening at the same time. I didn't hear her address specific problems going on now, but I may have missed her. Suki, you're Maybe. right. You're right, Suki. May, may, yes. may, may I, may oh, I intervene, you. please? May I? My name yes, was up please. For a while. Um, I found this a while ago. I had two pictures, so the board has it. The community board has it. Okay? And it's, it's funny because I worked, and what happened was that the construction people that are working on building the parts from there for all that took place. And they're seeing and getting pictures. Okay, so the board has it. Okay, so Mia, you're get you're getting all of this. Yes, I am. Uh, okay. For anyone who's not contacted the board previously, just email the concerns so that we're not all duplicating efforts. 
and that when a compl another complaint is submitted is uh, comprehensive and it contains everyone's concerns. And can we put Suki. it all to Yeah, Yaakov, yes. It's the point of clarification. Isn't that the board's job that when community member complains about a project or an issue that should pass on the complaint? What I mean, that's that's exactly Plus, what they're here for. So what I what I want, you know, as Mia said, they they're coming in one at a time, right? Uh, what I want is to put them all together, right? And to have our committee send it out as as a letter um, to the council member and uh, you know to the district service cabinet. So I, I would say that if somebody complains, obviously the office should pass on that complaint. If we're talking about lots of complaints in a formal letter, I mean, why don't we review it and see if, I mean, if maybe we could do something more that we addressed it, we assessed it, and we and we uh, support the city taking action. I'm not sure if okay, we should be doing so a formal. So let's, let's have Mia put together that letter first and then come back to us. That's what I'm saying. If, 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 it's, if they're going to just pass out a complaint, they don't need us. If we're asking something more, then I think we have to well, I, review I the think, complaints. Right. I think that's what I'm saying. I think the idea is, um, you know, if it's a large number of complaints and similar complaints in the same area, maybe this calls for like a more general traffic mitigation plan or environmental mitigation plan for the area. Um, so what I'm asking is that Mia put together the list and share it with us. Beautiful. Is that possible? Can we sure thing. I just need everyone to send the emails. Uh, essentially, everyone has kind of thrown out what their concerns are, and we just don't have to keep, keep rehashing it here. It would be better served if everyone just compile their thoughts in individual emails. We can compile it and get it out. Okay, so Mia, are you going to put that together, or do you want me to start a Google spreadsheet or something like that? Um, you can actually start, a, you know what, a Google spreadsheet might not be a bad idea just so that we can track all of this moving forward and just ha okay. have a record. Okay. All right. Thanks. So I will, I will do that. Thanks. Uh, Beverly. No, I was just going to comment on, we don't really know when, say for instance, I'm not going to know if Felice has already sent pictures in regards to their removing asbestos without the proper signage. I'm not going to know that. I have pictures where they've done that and the trucks are coming in and removing it, but I don't know if um, Felice has already done it. And the only person that's really going to know is Mia when all of us send them to her. So how, and Mia's asking us not to do, not to be redundant, but how are we going to avoid that? So I'll put together a Google spreadsheet that all of you are going to have to contribute to because I have no okay. idea what any of you have done, except Teresa is the only one who emails me with, with what she does. Um, okay. So all of you are going to need to contribute to that. And then, um, you know, Mia can also write in whether the district office has taken any action and Dante can write in if this was raised with the service cabinet and what the response is. And then we can share it with our council member and, you know, if appropriate, maybe there's something GCP can do as well in terms of, you know, asking for the mitigation plans. Teresa? Well, one thing, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just want to make a point that, um, for example, 1750 Bedford between Sullivan and Empire there have been, there's there's a litany of complaints and I've made them and my neighbors have made them. And it, it's just ongoing. It's like they, they continue to do things and they just accept the fines. The only organization that has been fruitful has been the the, the DEP with getting them to, to change how they're dumping the concrete is a big issue. Street collapse is a big issue. We've had four street collapses in this area between the area in front of McDonald's and on Empire and an explosion. It's bad, it's really bad. And I do send them to you occasionally, but the number of complaints I make are are more because I don't, you know, I feel like I don't wanna bug everybody with this. And it's very stressful to make, you know, it takes a long time to, to file these complaints and make them and file, you know, when the DEP contacts me, I, I, have, a, I have a phone number for somebody now, I can text them. You know, and this is is ongoing, and I, I don't have time to inspect 
all these sites. I just walk by the one every day because I take my dog to the park, right? So I see, and it's like, sometimes I don't even walk by there because it's it's so anxiety producing. They have multiple OSHA, OSHA complaints and violations and fines. And they just, it's not stopping. It's not, it's not changing. It's not any better. It's just continuing and they just continue to work and they just take the fines. And I think those fines, I don't think they pay them. I think in the end they get dismissed and it's, it's sad. And we are exposed to all these hazards. They didn't do proper mitigation at the fire sun site. For sure, I know they were digging, they were taking things out, but the DOB, by the time they come, they stop doing it, they hide, they lock it up. It's terrible, okay. you know, and- so a put, I, I don't put, know what we could do. If we make a okay, spreadsheet, so put, it's not gonna change it. It's kind of too late. And Andre, I have contacted Crystal Hudson's office about these things numerous times, especially when the street collapses were happening. And before they happened, I contacted Crystal's office. And when she had the senior thing at Megar Evers more than a year ago, I asked her in the office to come by and look at what was happening before, before any of this street collapse, before the concrete, any of it, I asked them to, for help. And okay, they just Teresa, kind of like, I, what, they didn't what really we, help. What so, we can do, what we can do to highlight the problem is to put them all together um, you know, to send it to the elected officials under a board, you know, a, a, a board stationary. And, um, you know, we can use this as a tool to push for the cumulative environmental impact statements. I think that's what everybody's been asking for for a long time, is to say that rather than only looking at this project by project, we need to look at the totality of all of the projects that are going on in the area. Um, within a relatively short short space of time, um, but let's let's move on. I want to talk about the actual rezonings. All right, um, thank you for listening. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, and so nine sixty two nine seventy two Franklin. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because um, you know the council member's office has already said uh, she is not satisfied with this. She doesn't want to see certification. Um, however, I just, you know, want to go over a few things so it's clear. Um, this project is not the same as the Spice Factory project. The site is essentially the southern half of what was the Spice Factory, um, not the 960 Franklin, which is also known as 124 Montgomery. Um, so th this project is um, an, a request to upzone from the original R6A and seven stories and 168 units to R8A and 14 stories and 475 units. So it is a major change and a major project. And I looked at the initial EAS and um, in fact, it, it, it is showing a shadow impact on the gardens. Um, to know more specifically what that is, um, you know, like what time of year or how long the shadows or, or whatever would be, we would need to see the EIS, which has not been posted yet. But you can see from this that the garden, Botanic Gardens, is in the potential circle of shadow impact. This kind of cross-hatched area here is the area that would wait, never wait, wait, be affected. And that, that's something to remember for the future that you know, a project typically is not going to have a shadow impact um, directly to the south of it. Um, is there a map you're referring to? I, I don't see it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing my screen. Shoot. Um, okay. Sorry, I just started talking without sharing my screen. Okay, now you guys can see it. So this is from the EAS. Um, so th this is the Botanic Gardens here. And you can see that it's it's within the circle where there's a potential shadow impact. But in order to know things like it, how long the shadows are at what time of year, um, we would need to see the EIS, which has not been posted yet. This crosshatched area is the area that um, would never be impacted by the shadow. And that's because, like I said, you know, um, it, it it's, you know, a building's not going to cast a shadow due south of it. Um, however, it will cast a shadow to the northeast and, and west. 
So John for the interruption. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you zoom out a little bit? I'm just I'm familiar with these types of graphics and it's usually not um, this usually isn't what a shadow study looks like. It's usually just like a, an area that you draw a radius around the project site. Yeah. Oh, so it, so, just, oh, it says longest shadow study area. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I um, I looked for that more specific shadow study, like you know, it's supposed to be on certain days of the year, and then show like the shadow moving through the times of day, and there it, that isn't there. And they said that that will be assessed in the DEIS, um, which hasn't been posted yet. Um, and, and I suspect they haven't posted it because they know there is an impact. <laughs> Is, but, I, you know, if, if it is the longest shadow study, it's probably like December 21st at whatever, 9 a.m. when the sun is lowest it and it's going to and it's going to cast the longest shadow. It I could think, be. yeah, I think what's going to be what's also interesting is to see other times of the year. I'm not trying to defend this yeah. shadow study. I'm just trying to give you information. No, about we, we do not have the full study yet because the DEIS is not posted. This is from the EAS. Um, okay. You know who did who did the study? Who did the study? Yeah. Is it like VHB? Is it? No, no I'm just yeah, wondering what consultant, the... what consultant did it? Is it VHB? Is it uh, AKRF? Is it? It's usually on the cover page somehow. But whatever, it's not that important. I I, I think what's missing in this analysis is the fact that Philip Habib and Associates. That the Book and Botanic Gardens has responded to this initial shadow study and have conducted their own shadow study and says that this development project will still cause harm to its um, greenhouses because of the two and a half to three hour shadow impact. So, you know, regardless of who might have done the shadow study analysis, because really one is just as well as the other. Um, the BBG has made a public statement about it being harmful to them. Yeah, they did testify at the draft scope of work hearing and that was what they said. Okay, so um, let's talk about the other one, the 7399 Empire Boulevard. Um, okay, so this one, um, it's a split R6 and C8 district. The northern half of the lot is in R6 that faces Sullivan Street. And the southern half of the lot, which faces Empire Boulevard, is in C8. Um, and so what they're asking for is an upzoning to C4-4D for the entire site. Um, so C44D is not something that we see frequently. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's worth understanding what that is. Um, hold on, I'm going to try to, let's, let's see if we can just... Okay, so Suki, if you go to Article Three, page, um, yeah, so C four dash four D has a commercial FAR of three point four, but it's the residential district equivalent of an R eight A. So that is the same as what Franklin Avenue is asking for R eight A. Looks like that's what they're all asking for. Um, and they're asking for 258 units, um, two full floors of commercial, um, and 191 parking spaces. And it would be 13 stories tall. Uh, any initial, like, reactions to either of them? Um, you know, I think we've talked quite a lot with Franklin Avenue about what we don't want to see. Um, I think for both of these, you know, I'd like to hear what we don't want to see. And, you know, since our elected officials are here, this, this would be helpful what we don't want to see and what we do want to see, ideally. Uh, Esteban? Yeah, um, and I was uh, sharing this with uh, Suki earlier today. Um, 
I think that we need to be really careful about deviating from the so far very successful um, approach of saying that we want to stick with the um, with the rezoning that happened in the 90s because it was done for a reason and that we are happy with that uh, as a plan. Uh, the moment that we start deviating from that, then we're deviating from where the tenant groups are, where MTOP is, where the botanical garden is. It's like one of the few things that we've been able to find uh, some really broad consensus around that we're not going to um, that we're not going to mess with that. And so I would just caution against deviating from that uh, right now, especially because it would mean an, a huge influx of a bunch of different uh, applications as soon as they think that we're not going to be you know standing strong by that. So just a thought. Oh, we're really doing an influx of application. Um, okay, whoever it is, can you please raise your hand and so I can recognize you and see who's speaking? I, I, I've been raising my hand quite, I don't know why it keeps low, getting lowered. Okay, Alicia? Um, what is really clear, if you look back at that map, Suki, is that there's three blocks of the C8, and this is a commercial district that does not allow residential. The moment that you break that, the moment that you break that and allow this development project to happen, now we have a slew of development projects all down Empire Boulevard. And they will use the breaking of this first one as justification for everything else. And we have a lot of sensitive lots on Empire Boulevard. There are two storage units that can be easily converted into um, uh, an application to rezone. We have um, the, the uh, Western Beef, whose owner has been selling off and developing his projects, um, property from Western Beef. And so we can see that as being uh, a motivator for Western Beef to be removed out of the community and a rezoning because it carries a lot of square footage. Um, and so, and and so, we will be talking about a massive, just a huge amount of development happening. And what would happen is, if if you look at the map, there are residential blocks that border Empire and call Empire their backyard. And just for you know, public sake, one of those um, properties are mines, private homes that are abundant are next to Empire. Once you start doing this kind of development, allowing 12 stories, and then of course the next application is gonna ask for 15 and the next one is gonna ask for 20, which we've seen downtown as the pattern, we will have no way of protecting our homes from all of the onslaughts that happen when you dig that far down into the ground to create development projects that will go that high. We're talking about fault lines. We're talking about, you know, uh, water, sewage. I personally had sewage and water in my backyard as an as of right across the street that um, that Tara had been complaining about and I complained about excessively. So I can just imagine now allowing those types of developments all on both sides, Empire, both. We're, we're talking about the ruining of our homes. It's, it's just going to be a done deal. And so we must preserve that C8. We must demand that they do not make any changes. Yes. On the C8. That the C8 must remain as it is. It cannot be broken because once we break it, then our whole neighborhood and especially the properties along the along Empire Boulevard will be done, especially those private homes. And yes, I want to preserve my private home. Yes, I bought it. I want to preserve it. I want to keep it. I don't want it to be flooded. I don't want to have to talk about trying to mitigate it or trying to figure out which development project actually caused the harm, which would be years and years and years of litigation inside the courts. I want my home protected. And, and so I would act very strongly that it's a no-brainer. The C8 is not going to be touched. We're not even going to talk about anything else. The C8 cannot be touched. This application has to go back to the drawing board and consider something else. Leave the C8 alone. Okay, thank you. Um, John? I was going to point out that the, um, the FAR associated with the C44D, as it 
correctly indicates on this chart is an R8A, which is an FAR, a residential FAR of 7.20. So the 3.4 isn't the whole story. Um, and I'm actually, I'm surprised that the, um, that shadow study that you showed, Suki, um, had a December 21st uh, shadow that was so short and so limited. It looked like it should have been a much more expansive um, shadow impact, but what do I know? <laughs> Could I show uh, the shadow study for um, seven? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm confusing what you've what Other you one. showed. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll show the shadow study for Empire as well. Um, but the shadow study for Empire actually, you know, once again, the area to the south, um, which is the homes on Sterling mm -hmm. Street, does not does not affect it. It's um, the area to the north, which is Ebbets Field, um, which and the uh, Jackie Robinson Playground and um, mm -hmm. the uh, the elementary school there, PS three seventy five, that may be affected. Um, I also I don't I don't know what to say about um, disruption in the neighborhood. I mean that that's I uh, I hear what Alicia's saying. I understand that that is a sensitive issue. I applaud her for disclosing uh, that she has an interest uh, in in preserving her property's uh, current condition. Um, but I do think that as a community, um, there is a need to. Uh, create housing and create mixed yeah. use and yeah. um, the the Empire Boulevard um, Avenue I mean it, it is a, an ideal location to have uh, mixed use and not just self-storage places it's it seems like a um, just a wasted opportunity and I just I I do appreciate everything that's that was said about uh, the C8 uh, zoning, but I think it's just a, it's a really difficult position to take when there is a potential for um, the option one, which is being considered for MIH, which would, if you take 10% of the um, 258 units, that's 26 apartments that are at 40% AMI. So when, where there's nothing, where there's no housing. So if you want to create affordable housing in the neighborhood, this is one of the ways you do that. I, I need to respond you, back John. to John since you uh, mentioned uh, Alicia, me. Alicia, I, I will call on you later, but I, I want to first call I on know, you. I know, he responded yet. back to me. I would like to respond to him. I did not mention him in my comments, so I would like to respond back. John uh, sits in a protected neighborhood. He doesn't have to worry about his home. He exactly. sits in the Buffalo Leftist Gardens community, which completely is protected, along with landmarking and deed restrictions. So he could easily say and afford to say he doesn't care about people's homes. Homes. He does not care about the residents. He also lives in the upper middle class part of the community, whereas this development project is going against Crown Heights, which has some of the lowest economically struggling residents in our neighborhood. And we know that the, the target population of just the affordable will never be affordable to this community. So stop the nonsense, John. We have already heard all of the stuff. And let's be clear that John is a developer. So of course his position will be, yes, develop in your backyard, but not in mine. Thank you. Okay, um, Yaakov. And, um, you know, once again, I, I, I need to ask- Tom Thomas is waving hands. his hand a lot and for a long Rob time. Robert's rules of order are that everybody gets called on first before people get called on a second time. So Yaakov. First of all, thank you, Suki. And um, I just want to point out again, again, I want to point this out. We have to respect each other at these meetings. He's not a developer. And if he was a developer, it's not, a way, it's not the way you talk to committee members, to community members. And it's cr incredibly frustrating. These meetings become attacks and personal attacks and he raised the point people could and disagree I, with his voice alicia please be quiet you're not a committee member and when you're called then you'll respond to me i don't i don't need your screaming in my house i'm on a phone in my room my kids hear you screaming i don't i don't need this negativity in my house please i i think that we go back i feel suki now again I, i'm not i don't want to talk about particular projects but we've over the over the years, I've been on and off 
ULIP committee, you know, we take these positions like no development, no rezoning. And then we take these positions that there's no affordable housing. And these, you can't have both. And either we're going to advocate for affordable housing, and that's going to be a priority. And we're going to work with the city or developers to make that a possibility and make sure the AMIs are truly affordable and to make sure that there's a lot of affordable units, not you know just a few, to make sure more 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 than required. That's one direction we could take. But you can't get up and you know half this meeting members were talking about how there's no affordable housing, and then Esteban, I'd love you to come back on and clarify. You don't want any rezoning at all. Period. So I don't see how. I mean, unless your position is that it's not affordable, there's no such thing as affordable, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be rezoning, we shouldn't be developing, and that's it. Nothing to talk about, but that's what it sounds like. And I, I think we really, we, we can't take two opposite positions. It just doesn't make any sense. Either we're going to work for affordable and there's going to be development or there's not going to be development. There's going to be no more housing. Or forget just affordable housing, period. We can't have both. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yaakov. Uh, Tara? Yeah, I, I just want to make the point that um, when you live outside of an area where you're having excessive development, it's very easy to make comments. And essentially, I feel like it's often the case where people that are living in the Lefferts area, in the Brownstones, are throwing Empire Boulevard under the bus. You know, it's the impact on my neighbors is it will be life changing and not 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 positive empire boulevard that area the commercial district should be maintained as a commercial district because it's a gem that we can use and be developed in a way that is commercial and will be helpful for the neighborhood for providing jobs manufacturing that's a gem the zoning that's there right now. Crystal got rid of hers in the upper uh, Northern Crown Heights and it's negative impact. You don't just want all housing, you want places where people can work and people can go to do commercial things, right? Not just, let's just change it all so certain people can make some money over there on Empire Boulevard. Hmm. Yeah, and I would like to just defer uh, to Tom Thomas, he's been waving his hand like over and over for about a half an hour and nobody's called on him. So please notice him. I think he wants to speak. Uh, Tom, my apologies. Are, are you able to raise you, raise your hand? You know, you do it through the um, the reactions button. Uh I've been raising my hand for a while. I, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I hit the unmute, unmute button. No, ever I, I have to unmute you. So you need to raise your hand through the through the button. It's like a little yellow icon. I don't see my picture. How, how am I gonna ra raise my hand if I don't see the picture? Uh you have a you you have a reaction button and you click on that and then there's a raise hand button. We can see. But go now. ahead anyway. Doesn't matter. Do you hear me or not? I hear you yes. now. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, Alicia is right on the money. If you open that crack, Empire Boulevard is gone. There's no justification for this. Everybody understands that the developer is in the game to make a buck. I've met 3% of the developers I've ever talked to have had any concern for the negative impacts on the community they're working in. I'm sorry, but that's that's the truth. So uh, I suggest we just ask our representatives, who are the only people who can make a difference, to convey to them that we don't agree that any time some guy wants to come along and upzone on, 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 on the pretense that he's developing 
uh, affordable housing because it's a joke. So if there's a motion to be made, uh, I mean, I, I, I would suggest that we make the motion that our representative uh, reflect what I consider to be a fairly uniform reaction to most of the people on this screen, that, that these upzonings are not legitimate. Exactly. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, I, I want to actually draw a distinction here between the north side of Empire Boulevard and the south side of Empire Boulevard. They have different zonings. The south side of Empire Boulevard is 100% C8, so you cannot build any residential. The north side of Empire Boulevard actually has a split zoning, as I said before. The north half of the lots that face Sullivan Street is actually R6, so it permits residential development as of right. The south half of the lots that face Empire Boulevard is C8, so you cannot build residential in that part. But there is currently residential development going on on Empire, for example, at 1730 Bedford, which is at the corner of Empire and Bedford. That is that split zoning as well with the R6 on the north half and the C8 on the south half. Um, they're building about 50 units plus the Lytle supermarket. Some of you may have heard about this. Um, so there is definitely going to be as of right residential development. It's just that that developer did not uh, ask for an upzoning. He's building as of right under the R6 zoning. Um, this developer is asking for an upzoning that amounts to uh, three times his current density, the density that he would be able to build um, under either R6 or um, under the C8 zoning is about 2.0 he's asking for a 6.0, or as John pointed out, I think it's closer to a 7.2 with inclusionary housing. Um, so that's where I have a problem, is he's asking for a, an absolutely enormous upzoning of both his you know, um, commercial and residential. And uh, you know, it's 25% 20, affordable housing, maybe 30% affordable housing. Um, the real, I guess what we would call the real affordable housing, the part below 40% is very minimal. And um, I agree with Esteban that if you give a major upzoning to one of these lots, all of them are going to come to you and ask for it. Um, and, and all of these are potential development lots. Um, so I think that while we do have to accept that there's going to be as of right residential development on the north half of Empire Boulevard, um, I think that we we need to understand that if we upzone this particular lot, just like you know the the portion of Franklin Avenue that was upzoned, all of the rest of them are going to be asking for this R eight A zoning as well. And I think we need to look at how many units that brings to the area, and does that line up with what our district wants and needs? And it's not clear to me that it does um, because. Uh, we already have, you know, we discussed this many times before, apart from these developments, we already have over 2,000 units in the pipeline. Plus, we have Vital Brooklyn coming, which is over, you know, like 1,500 units. Um, and, uh, you know, we built 3,500 units over the last 10, 15 years. So it's not clear to me that this is needed or that this is going to be good for us in terms of the environmental impacts. Um, you know, is is any one project good or bad? You know, I guess you could look at at what the benefits are, but my my concern is what is the impact on what what precedent are we setting for the whole neighborhood going forward? And what do we really want to see for the whole district? do we do we have limits that we want to set? Um, do we have things that we're not doing that we need? You know, as Teresa said, economic development. Um, we're not, we're, I, I haven't seen us really taking a strategic approach to that. Um, so that's, that's, that's my take on this. Uh, Andrew? Andrew, Magnus, go ahead.
sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think this is really tough. Can I ask a couple of clarifying questions about the development proposal as it currently exists? Do you know the unit mix of the proposed apartments? How many one beds, no. two beds, three bed studios? Uh, no. Because I, this no, is, I think, I, I think Rabbi Berman has been very honest that like, this is the time to not cross our hands and say, we never, we won't argue with, uh, we don't negotiate with developers. This is the time to say like, hey, we see your unit mix, make it more family size, make it more two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms to consider. I think this is the opportunity to have right sizing for, for new incomes. Secondly, uh, does the proposal include any provisions for open space, green space, accessible spaces, public spaces? Um, I don't. Is, is it not disclosed? Because I mean, it sounds like we have a lot of concerns that there's a lot of impervious surface in this area. This is the time to say, hey, we want to make sure that there's more green space in the future than there currently is on this 100% site covered laundromat. That's the other thing I would say. Thirdly, and I want to harp on this, this, this laundromat has been abandoned for 10 years since 2014. What has your board, ULERP, done to make this a more commercially viable corridor, help find new tenants, revitalize this portion of the, the community? That's a good question. <laughs> like, no, like seriously, if you go back on Google Maps, you can see the same sign has been there since 2014. Pinnacle Realty, 35,000 square feet for rent. I, I don't think that we can in good conscience say that, oh, we want to keep this and preserve it as is. When the same group of people that are in this call vehemently voted against the majority of the city of the yes, economic, whatever, opportunity thing on many of the grounds that would make things like this more appealing. I, 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 can't, I can't wrap my mind around it. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll, I'll mute myself again. I don't want to talk too long. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Felice. Oh, I lost her. Um, okay, Esteban. Yeah, uh, so just to respond to um to Yakov's uh question about the the I don't think I, I made the the uh I didn't say anything about like a blanket wide no rezoning. I was talking about the 1991 rezoning uh, next to the botanical garden that includes the some of these areas on you know along Franklin Avenue. Um, that's different from the rest of it. However, I actually I don't think that there should be any rezoning. Then I will explain. Um, first of all, I don't know how many other committee members here are tenants. I don't think that's actually a thing because it hasn't really ever been a thing to have tenants in these conversations. So I'm going to come to, I'm going to come here and I'm going to say exactly what I need to say as a tenant representing the people that I uh, have to work with every day. Um, I think that the arguments being made in favor of this negotiation strategy are really classic YIMBY arguments that like we've seen over and over again not work um, when it happens citywide for whatever reason, it, you know, things don't follow the studies or whatever. Um, so, but we've been here and doing the work and trying to push this stuff off for a long time. And it's made a difference in the affordability of the neighborhood. Um, it's kept our prices from getting to where they are, you know, north of Eastern Parkway. Like there's a lot of clear benefits. We also don't have the highest eviction rate in the city like CB8 does. So there are, there's, a lot of a lot of things that have been said just now that are um to me mind-boggling because it's like we're looking at a rezoning any every rezoning that has been like at least let's say in the last 10 years has actively displaced black and brown people from every neighborhood where they've happened in particular the mih based ones so that's where i'm coming from when i say this stuff and you can say that i'm not educated you can say that I'm, but like this is what i'm doing every day and if you don't if you can't respect that that's fine <laughs> and it doesn't really bother me but uh, but I will be clear with, with, you know, saying affordable housing doesn't mean that you're actually talking about affordable housing. It also means that you're talking about affordable housing for people that are not even living here yet, as opposed to the people who do live here and who are going to have to move out because that quote unquote affordable housing is more for like the middle end of, uh, of the lower incomes, not like the lower end of the lower income. So it's not quite as dualistic as it, as 
folks are making it seem on here. It's not just like, oh, you either support affordable housing or you don't. Um, affordable housing, a consideration of that has to be what kind of displacement is going to happen as a result. And is what they're giving you in affordability equal to or better than what you're giving up in terms of the, the residents that you're going to lose in a neighborhood? Um, those are real considerations that are really kind of hard to quantify, you know, in a study, but like we see what it does. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised because we've been talking about this stuff here at, in particular in community board nine for almost 10 years. I, you know, we, we, those, those arguments are out there and we've seen what happens too. Like we've already, like we've been able to, to see the trajectory of all of these rezonings and what it's doing and how, how it does it. So um, yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's, I just think it's, I think it's hard for, you know, people to talk about affordable housing and, uh, and in particular about low income affordable housing, um, if they're not tenants, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, you know, I, I can value your opinion, but you don't really have to do it in a way that makes, uh, the, the sort of quaint, um, community activists trying to, you know, protect their, their homes and their neighbors' homes as, as, yeah, I just, I, I don't like being lectured by, uh, by people who aren't doing this work. Anyway, yeah, thank you. One. Um, so I'm going to call on Beverly. Beverly is a, is a tenant, and um, I forgot to tell you guys she's a new member of the um, ULERP committee uh, as of this month. Thank you, Suki, and thank you for um, letting everybody be aware. Um, I am a tenant in one of the largest properties in Community Board 9, and as a tenant, one, everyone who's been here in this community for a second we don't need any more free spaces. We're walking distance to Prospect. We're walking distance to Botanical Gardens. There are three parks, one between us and Eastern Parkway, two between us and Rogers. To, to, to say that a complex being built should have free space, uh, then what is Botanical Garden and all the beautiful ones that are around us for? That's number one. Number two is, we have, I want to say eight buildings, eight new buildings between here and Union. And I'm willing to bet we don't have 150 apartments that are less than where people who are making $50,000 can afford. I am willing to bet money on it. None of the tenants in Ebbets Field can move out into any of these new ones. And secondly, we're not talking about the buildings that are already here, the tenants that are in buildings and the landlords being predatory, trying to make the kind of money that the new people who are building these buildings are making. So they are creating SROs in rent stabilized buildings. Let's think about the big picture, not how much free space we need or a laundromat that was asked to move from the building that it was in to further down the street. That's why it's not there anymore. Because the building was gonna be for sale and that family has been in dispute for years. Walk around the community and learn how long things have been here and what was the history prior to now. I agree with Esteban, very seldom we agree, but with this, I agree with him. Those of us who are fighting to keep people in the community, we have a very different perspective. Very different. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, Nicola? Um, thanks. I was basically going to support from before um, the fact that our fight for the last 10 years has been about trying to maintain the affordability of this neighborhood. As the years go by, rents have continued to go up primarily because of the large developments that have come in under MIH and other programs. We have been fighting to try to see what can be done to maintain the affordability. What programs can be brought in to maintain the affordability of the existing housing, making sure that we repair the housing, that buildings are not being, apartments aren't being warehoused, that's what we need to fight for. And as Beverly said, and Esteban, developments are going up, people can't afford to live there. 
and they, they're not affordable. That's been the ongoing message. Affordable for who? These buildings go up. They give us 20 units. Out of the units, maybe one might be affordable to somebody that lives in this neighborhood. That's not a calculation that works. And that is why we have the homeless situation that we're dealing with in New York City. To take Empire, which is a very viable commercial space, as Ty, Tyra, said, Ty, Tyra said, we need to look at, and we have thought about it. Thank you, Andrew. We walk by Empire every day. We know that the houses have been warehoused. The buildings have been there waiting for rezoning or waiting for deals that fell through because that's why the laundromat moved they had disputes. They were trying to put it some type of chain store there. So yes, we can, and we have asked what we can do to try and give encouragement to the landlords on those blocks to um, to rebuild, to put something, allow some kind of museums. We tried to do a visioning session for Empire years ago. What could we do to revitalize that area? I agree with you, but to stay with, again, Around the corner, we have, what, two or three buildings, developments going on right now on Franklin Avenue. We don't need more development on that stretch of empire. We're already looking at collapse, building collapse, floor, street collapses in that neighborhood. We've done our fair share in this neighborhood. We need to look at affordability, maintaining the affordability, maintaining a housing stop for the people that actually live here and want to continue to thrive here. Thank yeah. you, Nicola. Um, Alicia? Um, thank you, Nicola, for mentioning the fact that we have um, been examining that we've had examined Empire Boulevard. Just to put this in perspective, a lot of those development projects a lot of the uh, commercial um, buildings became vacant when there was the idea of rezoning that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that position has been maintained by a lot of the current um, property owners. Some decided to just do placeholders like storage units. Some have decided to not wait for rezoning and go ahead and build as of right. But there are clearly other properties that have basically said, okay, you know, we got a lot of pro development agendas now happening in New York City. Let's see if we can get Empire Boulevard. And that has always been. And personally, I have looked at, I have walked in my neighborhood and I have been proud of the fact of all the black and brown people that I see in my neighborhood every day. I am proud of the work that we have done to stop Empire Boulevard from being rezoned, from stopping, you know, Franklin Avenue, uh, Flatbush, Nostrand, all of these commercial corridors that would have been rezoned. I am very proud of the fact that we have stopped that and we allowed the black community that still exists here in this neighborhood. And it was our efforts, people who have been here, who have worked tirelessly for the last 10 years, both as tenant advocates, as well as rezoning advocates. And we have been able to keep this neighborhood an affordable neighborhood. And we will continue to do that. We will continue, and I'm proud of the fact that we've done that. To now allow three white men on this committee to decide that the black community does not matter. It's not something that we're going to sit here and watch happen. The black community does matter. We matter here. And and we have seen over the last two decades that allowing private developers to create quote unquote housing for the average New Yorker does not work. It does not work. And we know that anything, any negotiations always fail. We know that at the end of the day, the developers get the MIHs that are way above the community, the community can't afford it. We've seen it over and over and over again. So to think that somehow there's gonna be some miracle that happens in our community, if we sit down at the table and negotiate, just is a fallacy. We, and we're not gonna buy for that. I will stand here and continue to protect the residents of my community. I will stand here and continue to protect the black people and the brown people and the people of color 
to be able to maintain and live in this community that is currently still affordable. And I'm talking about the Crown Heights portion of the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Um, so it's almost 845. I wanna focus just for a few minutes on what we do want to see in these two sites and in these areas. Because like for Franklin Avenue, for example, we know that some type of residential development is coming, right? The R R6A as of right actually allows a, a fairly large building. You know, it could be 168, 200 units, depending on how big these units are. Um, the Empire Boulevard site also does allow a smaller amount of units as of right. Although I think this particular developer has indicated that if he doesn't get a rezoning, he would develop the entire lot with commercial. That's great. Um, so let's 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 talk about what it is that we actually want to see because I think that you know, given what's gone on in the area, for example, with one eleven Montgomery, I think it's highly likely that the Franklin Avenue site, um, if developed as of right, would be condos. Um, that's that's just you know these condos are selling out like the two bedrooms are are over a million dollars. You have one bedrooms that are um, as much as eight hundred thousand um, dollars. I I just don't see a reason that they wouldn't do condos unless there was something else going on, um, which uh, you know kind of brings me to to some of the things that I had emailed out um, about, uh, for example. Um, some of the city programs that that we're talking about, like um, I guess this, uh, the city council um, is um, the city council is 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 talking about H a couple of HPD programs called Open Door and um, um, neighborhood pillars. So Open Door is is a program to provide financing and I think they actually provide outright subsidies of up to $165,000 per unit for affordable co-ops. And the income band there is 80% to 130% of AMI. So this is not for low incomes. This is mm -hmm. for kind of like middle to upper middle incomes. Um, but it wouldn't be as expensive as some of these luxury rentals and condos. Um, the um, Neighborhood Pillars program is intended to help um, um, like nonprofits, for example, um, acquire and preserve um, affordable rent stabilized units um uh, at risk of deregulation um you know I, I know there was also a tenant opportunity to purchase act um which which is something that i i think is interesting um so you know i think something like the co-op program is is possibly an alternative to as of right condos um you know, I definitely hear that people are interested in the commercial development on Empire Boulevard. And, you know, I think we, we talked a lot about um, with City of Yes, that there is a need for C8 spaces, which, you know, C8 is, it, it does allow a wide variety of commercial uses, but it's really intended for automotive and light manufacturing uses that are considered too noisy, too traffic intensive, um, to be near residential. And that's why it doesn't permit residential. Um, I do think there's a need for these uses. Um, you know, I, I think at least about half the residents in our neighborhood, half the households in our neighborhood own cars. So there's a need for automotive services. Um, there's a need for destination retail so that we don't have to drive into downtown Brooklyn or Gowanus or wherever. Um, to go to our Home Depot or or IKEA or, or Trader Joe's or or what have you, um, you know, is is there going to be light manufacturing? Um, you know, maybe. Uh, you know, and, and and I would argue that actually that's not what we argued against with City of Yes. Um, City of Yes wanted to move that onto the regional corridors, like. Flatbush, Rogers, and Nostrand, as opposed to keeping that in the C8. Um, so, 
you know, yeah, I, I, I think if there are proposals to do something that would bring a serious a number of jobs, um, as opposed to like the self storage, which is usually just a couple of employees, um, I, I think that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but, it, you know, I, I, maybe it's also possible to do a few units of housing, a few floors of housing on top. I don't know. So, uh, you know, certainly, like I said, 1730 Bedford is doing 50 units of housing um, on top of commercial. Um, so that is that is actually the as of right in that in that um, on that half of the street. Um, and I haven't heard anyone complain about that, by the way. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say like what what you would like to see. Some of us might be okay with the as of right. Um, I would like to add that uh, Andrew Magnus may not know this, but our community did fund through donations a study and a uh, with Tom Angadi. We did a. Um, it was it was when I was newer to the neighborhood, um, but there was a, a study done where there was uh, many meetings. Um, I attended some of them where we volunteered and gave ideas and there was an entire plan proposed for how to develop and how we wanted Empire Boulevard to be developed with hundreds of neighbors input into that report study. And um, I know that they tried to present it at CB9 and it was it was kind of a fiasco. They uh, this was in pro miles days where they they didn't allow them to present it it was shut it down it was just like you know the sort of um blocking that's done but there is that study and it was done and it was uh hundreds of neighbors input into that and funded by donations um maybe alicia or nicola could tell you more because i, I was new when that happened so that was done. So we have a lot of ideas of what would happen, including, you know, how we wanted bikes, the corridor design, the trees, the what we wanted inside of those um, those units. Job job development was in there. So think about that because accusing us of not doing something that we have done is is hurtful. So please look that up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, Yaakov. Yeah, I, I want to address the point you made. I just, again, I want to say this again. I live in Crenite since 1982. My parents, my, my wife's grandmother came here in the 30s, actually. I, for somebody to say that because I'm white, I don't have a right or to imply, I don't have a right to have an opinion or some of this is about race. I'm not saying that different minority groups are not affected more than others. I'm not disputing that, but it's simply disrespectful and uncalled for. It's actually disgraceful. This is not about race. Everybody, no matter their color, their religion, or no matter their race, has a right to express an opinion. And Alicia, again, and Suki, please, it's, it's simply, I'm not gonna come to these meetings if I say something and somebody gets it, well, he's a white man, he has no right to express his opinion. I'm here since 82. My family has been here for a very, very long time. I have family members that were displaced, that left here because it was too expensive. I, I, I know, and I'm proud of my work that I've done to bring our communities together. So it's really inappropriate and, and should not be allowed. That's number one. And it continues to happen every meeting. Number two, the second, Suki, this is my challenge. I think what you're saying is great, and you're right that we should go out, we should do surveys and figure out what the community wants and what the community needs. But I think that um, we don't own this property. So all we could do is if a developer comes forward and says, I have this property I want to develop, and if they're, if they're trying to get a rezoning and they want our support, we could sort of negotiate with them what to do with that property. We can't come to somebody who owns a property and say, well, we'd like you to build here whatever whatever we feel is needed if we have, we don't have a seat at the table, if we can't offer them anything. So I don't know the purpose and the benefits of having these conversations 
unless we have something to offer, unless we're at the table. I, I, again, from a practical standpoint, just practical, if we don't own the land and we can't offer anything, then why would somebody even listen to our um, suggestions or our uh, or what we think is, is, is best suited for the neighborhood? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob. So um, I think that's what I was actually, you know, to your last point, that's what I was actually trying to get at, um, talking about some of these programs for uh, financing that are being offered by the city. I think that is something that's of value to developers right now. I I, I, I get the sense that uh, commercial financing is, it's not that easy to come by these days that, you know, the market's a little bit uh, uh, stopped up. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, without the 421A tax credit, I think that that was something that was used um, to to back financing, to, to back bonds, um, and that's not available anymore. So that's why I was mentioning these city financing programs, um, which I sent to all of you in an email as well, um, that that is the thing that, I mean, not we, but that the city is is putting on the table. Um, you know, what we can offer developers is we can certainly offer feedback. Um, you know, we can certainly tell them whether we're in what what we would recommend on rezonings. Um, my personal opinion is that actually rezonings are a fairly, uh, upzonings are a fairly inefficient way to lower land costs and lower lower development costs for affordable housing. I think the financing actually makes a much, much bigger difference to a developer's rate of return. Um, so that's just, just something to keep in mind. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we sort of chase this affordable housing through rezonings and having to give these absolutely enormous rezonings for very small amounts of affordable housing. And I don't think that's, um, you know, and of course, the neighborhoods don't like that for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that's an efficient way to do it. Um, you know, obviously, if a developer doesn't have enough density to build, let's say it's a very low density site or something like that, that's one thing. But, you know, when we have sites that are already in R6 and R7, um, I, I don't really think that makes as much difference as you would as you would think. Um, okay, I'm going to very quickly take Michael Hollingsworth, and um, then I, I, I want to move on to the committee fair. Um, yeah, um, you know what? Uh, never mind. You can just move on. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, so the last time we met, um, we discussed activities for the committee fair, but I, I forgot to hold a vote. Um, so we had talked about putting some poster boards with maps of the district, showing the four quadrants, showing the zoning districts, um, you know, maybe some like pop out photos of, of development in the district, what kind of development is possible um, with different areas and different buildings, um, as well as having a couple of iPads on hand where people could look at the Zola website and look up the zoning of um, where they live um, as a way of engaging with the public. Um, so the cost of the poster boards is it's not really going to be that high. We wanted like a couple of big, like two foot by three foot poster boards. And John Wolfling had volunteered to do the color printing of, of the maps at his office. Um, the, off, the board office said that they could provide the tablets. So I don't think we need a lot of money, but I, I think I want to put in a request for maybe like, you know, a hundred bucks or something just in case, just in case, you know, we need to do some printing, whatever, John can't do it. Um, and so I think we need to all vote on the activity and, and the request for the money. Um, so let me see, I need to, I need to go through the committee members now. Is, is everybody willing to write? Does everybody feel ready to vote on that or raise your hand if you want to, if you're on the committee and, and you want to make an amendment to any of those things before we vote, please raise your hand. Okay, going once, going twice. 
Okay. Um, so I'm I'm gonna take a roll call vote then. Um Suki, I vote yes. Nicola, oh Nicola, did you wanna did you wanna um I have two that? questions. Yeah. One, I wanted to know what the proposed date is for the fair. And if we were, I thought we were also looking to do some information about City of Yes and some oh. of the um, changes coming our way. Okay. Um, housing. Mia, do you have a date? No, the date hasn't been finalized yet, but I'm assuming it'll be around the same time as last year, early June. Um for the information for City of Yes, I'm assuming that's just printing of materials, so you can include that in the budget as well. Yeah, I, I'm you know, you know more than happy to do that, and I th I think um, Mia had also said that uh, you know groups can print things related to land use and and hand that out to I, I I mean you know like don't 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 like print up a whole like uh, you know booklet, but just if you want to just say something with who who you are and what you do, that's fine. You can. Um, uh, anything else? No, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So I'll, Nicola, I'll call on you to vote then. Um, this is on the hundred dollar budget. Is that? Uh, on the activities and the hundred dollar budget, which by the way, I don't think it's going to be that much, but I'm just asking just in case and, you know, obviously the board office is not, it's not going to let us walk away with this money if we don't spend it. So. Okay. So to, just to confirm, um, we are, we don't have a date yet, but we, for the ULERP committee, we are planning on putting up some boards that um, have the zoning for the different quadrants, high level zoning for the different quadrants of our district. Um, some iPad with Zola so that people can look up their address or their block. And, you know, we may be on hand to answer any questions that they have or concerns about what's going on uh, in their particular neighborhood. We'll have some handouts or some material related to City of Yes. And if there are any um, community organizations such as Crown Heights Tenants Union or um, MTOP that wants to have some material to hand out, uh, they could do that as well. That's correct. That correct? And also okay. the um, the big poster board maps, I would like to put um, some like, you know, like drop some pins on the maps and put like blow up photos of development, you know, like before and after so that people understand, you know, how our zoning is affecting us. So. Okay. Okay, so I vote yes. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Beverly? I vote yes as well. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Esteban? Yes. John? Yes. Thank you. Um, Tom. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, we voted on that, good. Um, and it's almost nine o'clock. Um, does anyone have anything else they wanna bring up? Very happy to talk about anything land use related that's a concern um in your part of the community or um anything alicia um i wanted to respond to because you didn't give me an opportunity to respond to the the idea of a vision for um empire as far as i know because you do have an r6 i think that the commercial corridors on um, empire should be left intact, the CH should not be broken so that there is no possibility of further rezonings on that corridor. Um, Professor Angadi had stated in his presentation when he was conducting the survey and the study on Empire stated that as long as you give developers the option to develop either commercial or residential, they're going to go for residential and they're not going to develop commercial. But once you put a 
firm position that they cannot do housing on Empire. They will do creative um, proposals and will do commercial development. And we've seen that already on Empire Boulevard. So um, there is the, the, the residential portion on the back that there's a possibility that, you know, that we, you know, to get some affordable housing, that might be something, but I think that we should adamantly state that the developer cannot use the back portion of his property to then justify the breaking of the C8 and then increasing it with residential and, and turning basically that entire boulevard into a very different boulevard than what it is, especially as a private applicant. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Alicia. Michael? Yeah, thanks, Suki. Uh, you said if we wanted to let you know about anything happening in the community, um, I just wanted to let people know that at 285 Eastern Parkway, um, there is a building, a uh, rent-stabilized building, 16 units, um, three are currently occupied, um, in which the landlord is trying to demolish it. He's trying to actually demolish two buildings, 285, 291. Um, and obviously to build luxury um, housing. So, you know, there are some of us in the community that are fighting against that. Um, you know, we obviously want to stop it because we feel like if it happens, it'll be, it'll set a trend and we don't want them to start demolishing or give a landlord's incentives to demolish buildings. So I just thought that people might want to know about that. Michael, thank you. That's important. Um, do you know what's the stated reason given for the demolition? Is it the condition of the building or is it just that he has enough extra building rights to build something much bigger? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, yeah, the reason is basically um, he has the money to do it. Um, that's what it comes. Unfortunately, the way this works is um, there are loopholes um, still um, in our laws. And basically, a landlord, basically, one of the, the the overwhelming thing he has to prove is that he has enough money to do it. And then like also have the plans, which he which he does. And he's provided that to DHCR. Um, and now the tenants, they have legal representation. So they're, you know, right now it's being it's working its way through DHCR where the, the, the different sets of lawyers are going back and forth. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that's the way the law works is that, you know, you know a landlord basically just needs um, the money to be able to do it and then uh, be able to put the plans together. And What's the can, plan for the new building? Do you know? Um, I believe it's eight stories. Um, so double the size under, of the yeah, original. Like under, yeah, underground parking. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's sort of where we are right now. Um, like I said, some of us are fighting to, to, to stop it from happening, but, you know, if it does happen, I think we could look at it as a harbinger of things that, that are going to come, um, you know, because yeah, unfortunately, that's, yeah, that's extremely concerning. Um, and, and um, you know, I, Esteban has talked about this before, but City of Yes would absolutely worsen these problems um, okay. because they're going to give more building rights in every district. Um, you know, I think I, I think that part of Eastern Parkway, if I'm not mistaken, is an R6A. So they would go up by 30 percent, you know, more for that developer. <laughs> um, it's not going to make it easier to to fight this. Um, yeah, I, I, and then there are going to be other buildings that really can't build that much right now, but would be able to build a lot more under under City of Yes. And um, I don't think they're taking that into account. I think their initial EAS, all of the examples that they gave were for building on vacant lots, which is you know not how it works in our part of the community. We have buildings all over that get demolished all the time. Um, and there's nothing to stop them. Nicola? I'm sorry, did we finish the vote for the we activity? Did. Okay. We did. Okay. okay, Tara? Tara? 
I'm unmuted now. Um, two things. Felice is on the phone. Um, she has been trying to talk for quite some time, and uh -huh. um, I think she. I don't know whether to, she needs to star six, not star six or star nine, or or how exactly that works. Um, but she's been on the phone trying to raise her hand and talk. Um, the other thing is that Esteban is making some really interesting comments in the um in the chat yeah. regarding um the displacement mih displaced um developers are asking us to make an exception to existing law they don't have the right to a rezoning also race as it relates to rezoning is not a fringe idea there is a legally mandated racial impact study now is part of the year process. A whole law in response to specifically race-related negative impacts. Objectively speaking, MIH-based rezonings displace primarily black and brown tenants. We can and should be talking about race anytime we talk about zoning and displacement. So I think that's important. And I don't know what Felice has to say, but she should we should recognize the, the people on the phone and Make sure they get a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Chara. So I, I see the phone number. Um, Felice, did you want to speak? I don't think she knows. What do you press? I don't know. Star nine, star six. What is it? I do not remember. Mia? Star six, I believe. I think she's struggling. I think it's star six to un to mute and unmute and star nine to raise your hand. But if she's automatically unmuted, muted, how could she unmute herself? Can phone people even talk to us? Oh, she's on. Oh, okay. Um, this is uh, it's amazing how um, things are unfolding. Um, everyone has valid points, and um, yes. We have to be mindful of uh, what's taking place here because we live here. Um, I was practically raised here myself. My parents, I took over their apartment, which was affordable for me. So um, I do know the fabric and the makeup of the community. And I am hoping and praying that, um, you know, we are listened to and um, we really have to enforce what we are saying to protect one another and our property. Um, I used to be on the ULIT. I really want to come back to the ULIT. I don't know why I was taken off. Um, I am in agreement to if you give an inch, they would take a mile. So we have to stay steadfast in um, our convictions and what we want and how we see it. And this is all for the future. And they keep on saying affordable. It's not affordable. You have to call it for what it should be, and that is low income. And I work for the union. I, I make I work with the city, and you know the members. My members they start out making twenty eight thousand. Um, you know you don't have many people making six figures. Okay, so it's not affordable. Um, you know, and in a shame, it, it is a shame that you have people from other or outside of our community trying to come in and tell us what they're going to do to us in our own house, okay? That's wrong, okay? We, we know what we want. We know what's best, okay? And stop trying to come in and dictate to us what you want to be done to us. Listen to what we're saying. It's, it's best for the future of this community. We do not have schools to sustain the buildings that's being built right now. Food resources, that's limited. And because it's limited, it's high, and it's getting higher. We don't have hospitals. There was once a hospital on Ocean Parkway there by the park. That's condominium. Mm -hmm. And they want to get rid of downstate, okay? Um, as I stated, we don't have any schools. We do not have the resources to sustain what they want to do or try to do, and we're fighting against from them doing Listen to what we are saying. We've lived here most, if not all, our lives. We know what's needed in our community. We know. Don't come in our house and tell us what you're doing to us in our own house. No, don't do that. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Felice. Um, I just wanted to end um, with something out of the EAS that was filed on Franklin Avenue. They changed their um, letter to DCP. Um, and, and this is very, you know, kind of reflects some of the discussions that we've been having and some of the discussions that are happening citywide. I don't know if you guys can see this, um, this thing that I'm sharing here. It says 2021 um, data from the American Community Survey. Um, oh, no, no, this is not the one. Hold on, it was a different one. Okay, rationale for the proposed zoning map amendment to R8A and R8A C24 districts. It says the existing R6A zoning is the product of the 1991 area wide rezoning and was designed to reflect the then existing built environment. However, the R6A zoning designation never reflected the conditions within the proposed project area, which remains a vacant non conforming manufacturing use. Equally important, in 1991, the city was not facing the same housing crisis it faces in 2023, a crisis acutely felt in commu Brooklyn Community District 9. The need for more affordable housing has been repeatedly cited by Community Board 9 as the neighborhood's most pressing need. According to data from the NYU Furman Center, the 2021 rental vacancy rate within Community District 9 is a mere 2.7%, 15% lower than Brooklyn as a whole. The existing R6A zoning district, which is, does not provide for mandatory inclusionary housing, is insufficient to meet this challenge. So I'm not saying that I agree with this, but I'm saying that I think these are all things that we need to address as a district if we do not agree with it. Um, and specifically, it cites um, the need for more affordable housing has been repeatedly cited by Community Board 9 as the neighborhood's most pressing need. That comes from the district's statement of needs that is put out every year. Um, you know, Dante sends out that survey to all of the board members and says, what do you think is the top need? And apparently, um, I, I know he showed us the, the data from the questionnaire out of like 99 responses, 16 people said that affordable housing was the most pressing need. And out of those 16, I think three said that preservation of existing affordable housing was important. And the other 13 were saying that building housing at all different income levels was the most important. Um, so we need to be aware that this is what that statement is used for. Um, I recall when the when I answered, I, I didn't, I was bad this year. I didn't answer it because I was so busy with City of Yes. Um, but two years ago when I did answer it, I said the most pressing need was for legal services um, for tenants, because we have a relatively high eviction rate. Um, and I, I know I was told by friends of mine who work in legal services that they're completely backlogged. Um, I also said there is a pressing need for down zoning and preservation, um, because we're, we're hearing a lot of complaints about demolition and how it affects people's homes and, and so on. Um, and uh, so, so these are things to think about, you know, when you answer the survey, does the survey reflect um, what the majority of us are, are thinking and feeling um, about housing and about development in our, in our district? Um, you know, it also talks about the vacancy rate. Um, you know, they, they cite 2021 data and, um, you know, is this is this reflective of what's going on in our community? I know a lot of you talk, are talking about rent stabilized tenants being pushed out in various ways, um, apartments that are being held vacant. Um, so, you know, do, do we want to put together a document that that reflects, um, you know, I know the housing committee is working on a resolution about housing. Um, do we want to maybe add something, some specific things to that, specific to things like um, vacancies, um, the need for affordable housing, what what we mean by that, et cetera? Um, you know, it's it's nine o'clock, so I'm just going to put that out there for you to think about. Nicola. Okay, my internet's acting up. Yes, I 
remember where I think the community boards that fact reinforced the fact that when we um, affordable housing as part of our community needs, as upzoning, that we want upzoning in our neighborhood. So I agree with you, Suki. I think that we um, we need to educate ourselves and educate our community are used. So I think what most people are talking about is really, again, maintaining the affordability neighborhood uh, possible. It's the same HPD Upzoning does not automatically result in affordable. Then turn around and get HPD and other programs to subsidize those units. So though to me, subsidize we could take those same programs and subsidize some of our existing um or, or look for ways to do that, uh, as opposed to upzoning. Um I don't believe that people wanting upzoning, they want affordability, which means maintaining the affordable units. I agree we need to educate ourselves and make sure that we're clear on the words that we're using so that it's not misinterpreted and misused in these applications, because I saw it in the Empire application as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. All right. So it's 915. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn if no one has else has anything to add. Anybody? Uh, Are we motioning to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I'll second that and um, thank you all very much. Thanks, and Lucky. thank you to Josh and to Andre Robinson for coming. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Mia. Good night. Have a good night. Good night, guys. Good night.